stepped into being a jazz musician and was also started her career out being a, uh, a teacher. So she taught us to read and write and um, also taught us how to shut the fuck up by reading a bunch of books very <laughs> early on. So I was very much into reading a bunch of books and writing um, and having a love of the English language just in general. So I'm not sure if I knew it was a song the first time I wrote it. I was just writing stuff. Um, and it, it, sadly, the first, I guess, song I wrote was a really terrible song. Uh <laughs> Because all my writing was really good, and then I was like, oh, I need to write this like in poems and in poems, and, and then I wrote a song, and I don't know if you guys know what freestyle music is, <laughs> but it was really, really big, and uh, especially... Latin, Latin freestyle? Yes, Latin freestyle, which uh, Hot 97 in uh, New York used to be Hot 103, Hot Caliente 103, and uh, freestyle music was really, really huge. And it was, it's fucking shit music. Um, but I was like, man, uh, me and my good friend, my best friend, we had, we were like 11 or 12. And we were like, man, we need to write like a Latin freestyle song. We're going to totally fucking kill this industry. <laughs> and what I need to do is not just write the song, but also write a really good rap verse. I did not rap at the time at all. Uh, and it was a really bad rap verse, and it was a really well-written pop song, um, which I have a lot of love for, which we'll talk about later. Uh, but I guess that was it. I guess that was like 11, 12? Yeah, sure. Um, I first want to say that I think there was some good Latin freestyle. There was. There was. <laughs> <laughs> no Sarah, Summertime, no, Summertime. Take me, take me to the water. Summertime, summertime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, guys, guys, so no, one no, yeah, no one wants to hear you say. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't. I, I, I also, I don't really know. I don't really. I honestly, I swear to you, I don't really remember what the first song that I ever wrote was. But I, I can guarantee you, it was terrible. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't come from a, a musical family at all. Um, I, I I was not trained in music, but I did um, I did grow up first. I, I got into punk really, really young. Like uh, when I was ten, I went to see Adam and the Ants. That was my first mm-hmm. concert in, in 1980, and um, and then I got into to very early hip hop, and I saw you know a lot of young people with microphones like doing things, you know. Mm-hmm. And then I got into, like, sort of more back into punk and, and hardcore. And, and in that world, it, it was a very peer, you know, it was a very peer-based world. Like, um, you had the kind of the bigger, older punk bands that, you know, you aspired to, like, the Clash and things. But largely, it was kids of, of uh, you know, junior high and high school and maybe, like, early college age sort of singing to each other about the things that, bugged them, so there was a lot of, there were a lot of terrible songs. <laughs> um, but there were but there were also a lot of really meaningful songs to that you know to that uh, kind of moment in time for for these people, which is a continuing moment in time that new people you know continually plug into. Um, and so the idea of 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 writing songs and becoming a songwriter in a weird way, I kind of think it was like you know. Like I wasn't on the football team, you know. You know what I mean? Like my this is what my peer group did, and uh, I was part of that, and um, and so I I dabbled in it, and it was only really I mean I think many years later, like in my early twenties, when I started thinking seriously about about like actually kind of you know having a voice uh, that um, uh, having a voice of my own that. As a songwriter, that that uh, could sort of jump that particular scene's boundaries, you know, and, and actually, you know, write songs that weren't just for my immediate peer group, you know, that kind of tackled broader issues, and or that actually just were songs meant for songs' sake, you know. Um, 
I don't really know where I'm going from there, <laughs> but it winds up here. Yeah. The point, so. First, first song written. I don't. I really don't remember. I really don't remember. And you? Um, I think that music for me was. I don't know. Like I, I think when you don't, you feel like you don't connect to anything or you don't fit in. I mean, I don't mean to be like I was an outsider. I, but I, but like in my family, I was an outsider. So I felt really disconnected from everything. And I think with music. It was a dim light in a long tunnel where I thought, I don't know what that is, but it feels like something to go towards. And I wasn't like, a lot of my musician friends are people who had an innate talent, would play along with Beatles records and figure out how to play. Like, I can't even imagine that. I tried to play along with, I, I remember sitting down and going, I'm going to I'm gonna try to play just this one thing that I hear in a record, and I, and I just, I couldn't do it. Like, I couldn't, if you sung a melody to me, I would not be able to sing it back to you. <laughs> so, I, so, but even, like, not really having any musical talent, I, I just was, like, kind of making my worm-like way towards this thing. And um, for me, the, the, well, the first song I wrote was, I put music to a, a Lewis Carroll poem, and I was maybe 13. And that was actually not bad, but the, but every song after that for years and years was ter- was terrible because I I just I didn't really understand that there was kind of a, a logic and a science behind uh, chord progressions, and I would just choose some chords and try to make a song, and it sounded terrible. So so for me, learning some music theory uh, was was the key to um, being able to write a song. Uh, because when I hear chords, then I, you know, I think the one innate ability I have is to just come up with a melody. And if I have a thing, a, a line or an idea that I'm thinking of, I can sing that over those chords and it sort of makes some sense. And, you know, but, but for the rest, it's like it's a lot of trial and error. You know, I mean, you have to do it and do it and do it and do it before your brain starts to kind of do some of the work underground for, for you. John? I remember the first song I wrote. I, uh, I grew up in, a, in the far west in a suburban, like, um, completely suburban environment, and uh, we were all super fans of the first generation of British heavy metal. And um, So it looks like Iron Maiden and Saxon. And Saxon, right. And... <laughs> and uh, the first concert I ever went to was Dio with Dokken. Um, and so that was a very, um, <clears throat> music was, you know, hugely popular among my peers, and everyone wanted to be a guitarist, and everybody wanted to be a fast guitarist. Uh, and I didn't, and, th- and there were all the issues of credibility in the first generation of British heavy metal that then, you know, became issues of credibility in punk and later you know, like there were bands that were cool and good and there were bands that sucked and were bad. And, you know, there was a <laughs> clear dividing line. For reasons. Um, I did not have the de- dexterity to be a, a guitar player. I tried. I sat, you know, the, and guys would practice six hours a day getting good at the guitar. And I just could not make these, like, dumb mittens work. And I still can't. You know, I've never been, I've never been able to be a... a a good guitarist because I have, like, I feel like demonstrably little talent in this hand, my left hand, which is the fretting hand. It uh, it feels even now like an alien to me. <laughs> it does not do what I say. And so um, I was part of this metal culture. I wanted to be part of the metal culture, but I couldn't play the guitar worth a shit. And my sister was, in about 1980 or 81, decided that she was New Wave. <laughs> and so then I had, a, I had an enemy in the house. <laughs> <laughs> and the first song I ever wrote was, I picked up a guitar, and I had, guys had showed me, like, the basic chords, and I could put together G, D, C. And uh, one day I followed my sister and her friends around the house. I was... 13, they were 11. And they had their Duran Duran fedoras on and their, like, roach clip feather earrings and their, <laughs> and their Feed the World sweatshirts on. And I followed, I followed them around the house with my guitar strumming away, and the song was, I've Got Green Hair. 
and I just yelled that at them. <laughs> <laughs> I've got green hair. I'm so cool. I think I'm punk. Fuck, 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 fuck. Oh, I am so cool. I am so punk. <laughs> and uh, after a while, you know, and they were like, shut up, shut up, shut up. And then eventually, like, they kind of moved on, and I kept walking around going, I've got green hair, I am a punk, I'm so punky, fuck, fuck, give me punk. And, I, and then I just wandered down into the basement, and I've been basically doing that. Ever since. Um, so spite is what kicked up your hair. Yeah, it was just like, basically, like, as a metalhead, I hated my sister and her dumb punk friends, and that's motivated my songwriting from, from that point on. From day one. That's, that's kind of awesome. Uh, Gina, I actually want to follow up on, on something you said. And, and for these, we don't need to go down the line, just you know, jump in when you have a thought, or don't jump in if you don't have a thought, because we'll go, move on from there. But you mentioned uh, that you really didn't think about it as necessarily songwriting, that you just thought about it as writing. I mean, I know that when I was a teen, um, I could show you, but I will not, uh, the, the concept <laughs> album that I wrote called oh, Suburban God. Excursion that was yes. all about the alienation of suburban life. From did the you perspective make a cover for it? Oh, God, of course I did. <laughs> and, 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 of course, from, from the deep well of wisdom that every 17-year-old has. <laughs> but the point was that uh, I was doing that, but at the same time I was also writing short stories. I was yeah. also writing a little opinion columns, again, from the deep wisdom of a 17-year-old. Um, and what it seems to me is uh, the creative impulse is, in many ways, seems to be interdisciplinary. I mean, as, as songwriters, did you find that, um, that, that that creative impulse was leaky, that it wasn't just about songs, but it was also about other things? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's, there's definitely a visual component to making and releasing records that I'm sure some people, um, and I don't, I don't mean this as a negative thing, I just mean that I'm sure some, I'm sure some people more than happy to sort of hand that off to somebody else, but um, but it's something that I always like to, to at least keep my hand in, if not actually work on myself. That's like you know, visual arts are something I'm interested in. I always drew, and I did other kinds of writing that were also not as good. I I I, I can't remember the first song I wrote, but I can remember a really early stab at poetry. Which I don't know if there's anybody here of the, an age to remember a. a double-sided uh, one-sheet mailing that would go out four times a year called the Tolkien Quarterly <laughs> in the 80s. I have, I have a whole top of stack of them. Do you really? <laughs> you do, really? Yeah, do. Well, you may find my poem, The Arkenstone. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> I am going to look for that. <laughs> I definitely feel that poetry and lyrics are completely different art forms. Mm-hmm. I agree with okay. that. I agree. And, uh... <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Could the following guests please contact the guest services desk by dialing zero from Many House Phone. Mr. Ansel Baker from deck number six. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Alan Roderick, do you have anything else? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I write poetry and have for always. And I always want that to make me a better lyricist, and I guess it does. But but poems almost never become lyrics, and uh, and that uh, that isn't always clear as I'm writing it. Sometimes I will sit down to write lyrics, and it will turn out I've written a poem, and I will be very disappointed <laughs> because I'm trying to write lyrics, and I've written a poem, and it's like, well, now I have another poem. <laughs> To, to put in my poem vault, which I will have to show anyone. I think, um, uh, also, and uh, very similarly, my brother, uh, six years older, introduced me to a lot of punk and not a, a lot of new wave, so it, my stuff kind of tended to go everywhere and be very open. But he was also a, a, an amazing, he still is, great uh, visual artist. So, and I couldn't fucking draw for shit. And I always wanted that to, like, kind of be my superpower in the family because, like, everyone could make music. But, like, he was the motherfucker who could draw fucking comics and do amazing <laughs> shit. And I was like, what the fuck? Why don't I have this? Why can't I wear glasses? Um, <laughs> and so I think when I started really, really writing, I wanted to make everything really visual for two reasons. Because I wanted to make up for that. And also because I never had enough money to do 
visually the kind of songs that I wanted to write. So I had to write them um, in a way that would kind of bring the listener more, just kind of be there. You have to be able to see it. It has to be more visual without me having to shoot the video because we don't have the budget to do that. <laughs> well, people are doing videos on the boat right now. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm, I'm planning on shooting three before we get off here. So. <laughs> if I can help you, you're, yes. very, you're, you're an adept in many different disciplines of the arts. Thank you for saying that. Um, I, I go in and, out, in and out of periods where I like to draw and paint and do that kind of thing. Damn. I don't think I'm that. Your, your paintings of U.S. presidents are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Amy did a series of the worst U.S. presidents that are all really good. The top ten worst pres- presidents. Okay, I, I want the James Buchanan. Oh, oh and it's very, it, it's very, uh, it, he looks like a zombie. Yeah. Yeah, it's very green. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, Ted, you were talking about um, when you were younger, just like the punk scene, the punk scene, the punk scene. And then slowly moving beyond the punk scene uh, to kind of expand your horizons. Um, in many ways, at least for our, for an outsider, I mean, there's much about the music, uh, you know, the music world and uh, and the industry and, and songwriting, which does seem uh, intensely tribal. You know, metal writers write songs in a, in a metal fashion. Punks write songs in a punk fashion. Um, at what point uh, do you uh, abandon the, the, the tribal identity and, and, and try, try to expand beyond that? Well, you have to understand that in any tribe there are, are always the, the pure, there's always going to be the puritanical element who will want everyone to sort of hew to the original kernel of the idea that this group of people gathered around, you know. And, um, you know, honestly, like sometimes that's a well that is very refreshing to go back to. Also, you know, like if I'm if I'm uh, feeling a certain way, I want to hear. All I want to hear is, you know, Reagan, I'm killing me. Reagan, I'm killing me. Reagan, I'm killing me. Reagan, I'm killing you. You know, kind of, yeah. kind of songwriting. But um, but I think that I actually think that um, in in almost every case, whether it's whether it's the metal tribe, or, you know, or or, or or whatever, you know, they're there's always a lot more kind of diversity going on within the songwriting than what, uh, than the kind of mantle that, that people you know, tend to get thrown on them for being part of a scene, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and speaking from my own experience uh, with punk, I mean, of course, you know, uh, like you can't, you can't take an album like London, like the Clash's London Calling and say that it's not a punk record, but it sounds, you know, it doesn't sound anything like a Discharge record. It's a reggae <laughs> record, let's be honest. Yeah, <laughs> in many ways, yeah. You know? And, um, and, you know, so these, these kinds of, um, these kinds of labels are, are useful in, in helping us sort of establish our own identities, I think, both as, as, as fans or as artists. Um, but, you know, Again, like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say that uh, it's if if you're if you're perfectly happy um, continuing to 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 work with within what you know uh, strictures that you've set for yourself, then that's great. And there are bands that continue to churn out amazing album after amazing album that really don't deviate from the form, right. like Motorhead or something, you know. <laughs> um, but. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that anyone up here probably has the same experience of having diverse interests of what they listen to and therefore what influenced them. And just, you know, op- at various times in your life, sort of open up different doors that allow you to say, like, oh, I could step through this one and walk down that hallway. And, you know, it, it uh, and not just as an intellectual exercise, but because it it resonates with me at this other, you know, you stream of music to. or something. Yeah, You kind of have to. Um, cause then you just leave doors that are kind of closed and, and you can't do that. So there's certain, certain doors that you kind of have to open to make things feel okay. And you don't necessarily know when that's going to happen, which is the weird part of it. Well, and also, I mean, are there doors that you, uh, kind of hesitate at? Are there things that you were scared of that you still kind of have to get through? Oh, this is getting heavy. Um, <laughs> yeah, the karaoke's uh, after. <laughs> um, 
I think there, for me, there were. Um, and either you get to a point where you're like, I don't fucking care, or you don't. Um, either you just fucking wander down the hallway and you're like, nah, this fucking door's open, I'm gonna do that shit. Or you're like, I don't know. I don't know, I'm going to pass it, I'm going to pass it, I'm going to pass it. But it, no matter what it is, I think those elements will leak into other songs you're trying to write anyway. Um, and it'll always kind of feel kind of empty if you don't do that. Yeah. For me, the door, <clears throat> the difficult door to go through was always toward simplicity. Mm-hmm. Um, uh-huh. Because... <laughs> Like, if you come up in a punk scene or in an early rock and roll scene or an English folk scene or any kind of very tribal music scene, the form is very established. You learn it. You duplicate it. Sometimes you duplicate it for years before you start to branch out. But a lot of us that came up in a world, I mean, coming up in a sort of post-rock and roll world, right, if the first thing you start with is Bohemian Rhapsody, and you're like, I want to make music like that. (laughs) I want to make music like side two of Judas Priest's Rockerola, which is a song cycle encompassing all the four seasons. <laughs> there, that's not a, there's no form to inhabit there. Like you're, you're already looking at artists that have learned forms and broken them and built original material. And, if, and so to start there, um, you're just you're up against this impossible task. And for me, it was a, it was always going through, going backward through doors and like, I do not have to reinvent music with everything I make. I can seek simplicity and and I can just make something elemental. Try. Is, is that a little bit about ego, though? I mean, uh, from, from the uh, fiction writer's point of view, um, a lot of the stuff that you write when you're, you're really uh, young um, is to try to impress people how much of a command you have, either the language or the situation of the characters or something like that, and, and not having the, the wisdom, you know, the ins- installed base of years, as it were, um, to recognize that, uh, you know, filigree prose doesn't mean anything if there's not knowledge behind it. I mean, is part of it, I mean, but you still say, look, isn't this impressive? Isn't this? Is that some of it, some of it ego? For sure, but also, if you're not part of a, like, you know, 15 years ago or whatever, we were talking about the death of the novel, and everybody had everybody had decided that the basic form of a novel was dead, and we needed to, you know, like, have all these narrative, like, whoop de doos So, if you're not, if you're not with a little, with, with a little core of people that have some kind of, like, old school, like, this is the truth, and everything outside of it is BS... You're just in the big. You're just reading the reading the London uh, review of books and feeling like, well, I guess this is the standard or whatever. I'm chasing after the masters at every level. Yeah, I mean, I think um, even in 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 hip hop, it's um, it was a form of being very competitive and uh, being like, oh man, I really have to get through using all doing all these rapidy rap songs which I still call the rapidy rap songs when I'm doing them. And then I'm like, oh, good, I've done enough rapidy rap songs, I can go on and do other songs that I want to do. Um, so it, it, it yeah, it, it, it took a, probably about 20 years to kind of get out of that um, form of writing, really competitive, ego-driven stuff to be like, oh, I'm fucking playing, I'm fucking better than you, and I'm challenging myself at the same time. Um <laughs> And then be like, there's simple shit that can be really great, and I can be really good at writing really good popular songs that just are able to be beautiful in its simplicity. Um, so it's it's a really interesting choice to kind of put that down for a second and be like, I don't have to use nine million of the words to be able to convey this. But I think especially in hip hop, it's a it's a totally different world because we have to do so much. I think it takes a long time to figure out what works for you. And I think it takes a long time to get over your initial thing of it's, well, speaking for myself, there was sort of a a feeling of like, I really want to have the identity of a musician. I want to have the identity of being a a songwriter. Um, So so the first thing is like you scramble to sound like someone else who's a songwriter uh, so that you can have that identity. And then you get to be part of sort of a tribe or a group. And, and I was in this kind of, you know, art, new wave, noise, punk scene. 
uh, that was really fun and, and was good for me because it let me really write any kind of bullshit, crazy ass thing, <laughs> like not knowing what I was doing and, and having that be totally accepted. But eventually that became its own, you know, its own cage. Uh, because honestly, what works for me is to, I mean, I like melody. Like, I, I like melody, and that's my, that's my strong suit. That's the thing that comes naturally to me. Sure. Everything else was, was work and learning structure from other, you know, other people. Uh, so, so for me to, to kind of quit this, you know, Nina Hagen craft work influence, <laughs> what I, you know, thing I was doing, and to, and to play, Really melodic, uh, you know, uh, Thompson Twinsy Duran Duran kind of stuff. That was a big rebellion, right. you know, because I felt like I wasn't really allowed to do. There's things you're not allowed to do in whatever scene you're in. You're not allowed to do them, and uh, you know, so that was like that was my big rebellion. So when and when you started doing that, I mean, did you? Uh, no matter you said, you know, whatever you do, whatever scene you're in, there's always going to be some boundary you're not supposed to cross. Yeah. And when you do that. Um, you're immediately going to get the pushback. I mean, whatever community you're in, regardless of whether it's music or it's, uh, you know, writing or it's theater or whatever, um, transgressor, transgressors get punished one way or the yeah. other. When that hit, I mean, how did you respond? To that? Well, I mean, I don't even know if it was something people were saying to me or just you, you just kind of perceive it as this scene is about this is about these, you know, more specific things like the you know, a, a, fr- a close friend of mine who's in this other band that we play with a lot. Uh, they had a song where the lyrics were the, the a recipe to shrimp flambe, and you know, and it's like, well, there's no feeling in that. Like that's really that's funny, and that can be creative or interesting or ridiculous or whatever. But but for me, I I need to have some kind of yeah. I started to feel like I needed to have some kind of feeling, and just nobody was doing it. So I think I I perceived. No one in this scene is doing that, but people over here are are doing things that are that's closer closer to what honestly you know like I'm kind of ready to do. I will cop to at times um, you know feeling a little too acutely like the the pressure of the expectations of one's one's audience you know? and I think that what it has done to me in the past is not not limited uh, limited places that i that i would go, but it has it has made me consider like, oh, am I putting enough of this thing that I know people think of when they think of me into what I'm doing, you know? And that's that can be a real that's weight right. on your yeah. forward momentum. As, everything as an artist stops as, well. as soon as you yeah. think about what people are going to think about it. Everything stops. Yeah. You can't do that, and that's <laughs> one of the ways that I, you know, if I find myself in a writer's block position, I get, you know, I say. You know what? This is a song you will never play for anybody. Just finish the song. Right. And then, and then later you can decide. Well, maybe I will play for somebody. But, but right. while you're doing it, just like this is a song that will never see the light of day. Just don't worry about it. Say whatever you want to say. We have been working together for over two years now. You've never, you've never brought that amazing. <laughs> that is a great idea. Yeah. Out. Oh. <laughs> you're gonna use that immediately. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 in the mid '90s, I had a, a group in Seattle that. Uh, our s- signature sound was that every song had at least three times signature. <laughs> <laughs> and we were really reinventing music. We were really on the, you know, the cusp of like math, indie, that was, you know, never going to beat the nation. <laughs> and uh, and I, re- I remember, but the thing was I had the luxury of being both 28 years old and also not having any fame or a sta- I was not an established artist. And so I changed my sound. And I remember, take because I wanted, I wanted people to be able to dance to the music I was making. Because at every song, at least one part of the song, I would look out and see the crowd start to dance. And then in my head, I would be like, "We're about to go into seven thirteen time." And this is gonna get ready. And so I, I straightened my music out, and I watched my entire fan base leave. Right. But then a whole new group of fans came in that then grew with me. And that, the thing is that I think now that I have fans that have an expectation of what I sound like, it's much harder for me to make that same kind of bold choice. Sure. Because it feels like, well, now I, now I do have an established sound. 
I actually want to follow up really quickly on, on something you said about the, the thing of I'm writing this just to write it for me and to get it, yeah. to get it done. Um, because that's something that I do all the time uh, when I, I'm trying to add a tool in my toolbox, right? Where I, it's like, this isn't for anyone else. It's going to be terrible. The whole point of yeah. it is to, 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 to work with that. But what I fundamentally do, um, and I will be talking about this tomorrow or whatever day it is that I'm, I'm talking about the basics of starting writing, um, is the permission to suck. Yeah. Because the, the whole point is... Be terrible. Yeah, because the whole point is... Or not judge to, it later. You know, just suspend it. Like, I, 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 I think judgment is a real, you know, freezer-upper. You, know, you can't... Jesus Christ! I, I mean, I'm I'm married to somebody who is like the, the he's the he's the worst at it, and I'm always like because he's a great songwriter, but he's a perfectionist. Yeah, and it really is that thing of like it doesn't have to be done perfectly; it just has to be done. Just fucking finish it. Right. <laughs> right. Just do it. Just sit down yeah. and write something. Write a one minute song. Write a ten second song. Then write a song in ten in ten minutes. Like do anything. Right. Literally anything. Yeah. That's that's me. That's me. You're the perfectionist? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just not, constantly... I'm not, I'm not, I don't know if it's as much of a perfectionist as I'm like, eh, fuck it. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, yeah, and so I have no surplus of songs. I have no song that's not... Um, there's an album that'll... There's two albums that I'm holding on to right now that'll come out in the next month. But all those songs are coming out. So I... And I don't write. I don't write anything, especially rap wise. I've never written anything beforehand. Like otherwise, like I'm, there's the beat. I'm gonna fucking write to it. I'm recording it. That's happening. I'm right. just, well, I've just. I've never done that. I got a backlog of about thirty that I've been tweeting I for wish, five years. I, if I you want to borrow something? <laughs> I wish I did. And don't wish you did. No, I, I do. I do, but, but then everything else, I kind of just got to a point that I'm like, oh, there's certain things that I like, maybe you want to spend some time on, like, working on it. I'm like, eh, if it fucking sucks, it sucks. I like it, so I think I have pretty good taste in music. So yeah, no. fuck it. If you don't like it, then you don't fucking like it. I honestly believe that the, that the biggest... Uh, that the biggest factor in being an artist or being good at anything is having good taste. I honestly believe that because well, you can just generate, generate, generate like a monkey at a typewriter and right. see if it, and then, but if you have good taste, you can go, that's not bad. That's yeah. Not bad. <laughs> but it's so hard, generate. though. It's really hard to have it's hard, good but taste about your own stuff. It's, I, I, I mean, it's hard to be, it's hard to be objective about oneself in a lot, in a lot of ways, but, I'm just kind of recording maybe just stuff like and being like, being like, no, this is, no. It's kind of a place I'm not that hard on myself about. Like, I can, you know, if it's good, I go, it's good. And if it's not good, like, I don't think it's automatically great just because I did it. Right. And I don't think it automatically sucks just because I did it. Can I can I add something to that, too, which is the 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 ability to be, to attempt at least to be objective enough about your own work that you can, that you can effectively edit. Yeah. You know, and, and yeah. like I learned, you know, I learned some lessons. Like I, I, look, I like a good riff. I will ride a good riff <laughs> off into the sunset. You know, and, and maybe no, I'll turn around ten minutes later and nobody's following. <laughs> um, and uh, there was a TV show that I was playing on where like our, the song that we were going to play was like twenty seconds too long, and so we found we only found out that morning, and so we had to do some quick like just off the top of the head, like, cut, 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 cut. And we were very frustrated by that. And then I watched the show later that night, and I was like, oh, that's so much better. <laughs> it's such a better song, you know? And um, and that got me thinking, that really got me thinking a lot more about that. And then in working with you, um, the songs that we've written, I I feel like... I have really learned through uh, a collaboration that involves enough sort of uh, uh, comfort that, you know, you've got each other's best interests at heart, nobody's up to bruise or one-up anybody, um, and also uh, faith in, in the, the, the talents of your writing partner that each song uh, itself kind of becomes a puzzle to solve, you know, a a song to make the best song that you're writing at that moment, yeah. and a song that you don't have to have all of your your you know the 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 uh, you're not forging the 
You're not forging the uh, you want to do a Tolkien consciousness of your generation in the, in the smithy of your a, soul. You I feel know. like there's a Tolkien reference that's coming that up. That's a James Joyce reference, but yeah. <laughs> but they, you're not, you're not, you know, you don't have to pour every ounce of yourself into every single note of everything yeah. you do so that you become so invested in it that you can't see the forest for the trees. That's right. you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you can't see that there's 20 seconds can be just cut out of it and it'll sound great. Yeah. Yeah. If I, uh, I, I go back and listen to my early records and I, I have so many great edits I would make <laughs> now. Yeah. And the challenge is with this thing that you're working on to not to not Michael Pym it and destroy it before it's born. Yeah. But also have enough uh, distance from it that you can you actually can recognize the weak spots and edit them in real time. Yeah. And I still at at forty six years old have not figured out that 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 balance, that combination. I'm either I'm either hating the thing um, I see its weakness, and so I hate it. Right. Or I fail to see its weakness, and I have a, I have a 14 minute song that has one chord. <laughs> that's called the Arkenstone. <laughs> <laughs> what was the question that you were going to ask him? I'm just. What do you think are the factors that go into? Oh, but maybe you answer that. You see its weakness, and you hate it. You see its weakness and you hate it. Well, you think you see its weakness. Yeah, right. I think I think I see its weakness, and I'm yeah. often I'm often wrong. And this is, yeah. I mean, if, if I, I feel like I have really good taste in music too, and I feel like I understand how music is made. And if we were listening to your records right now, I would have very interesting comments about every song. <laughs> <laughs> but my own stuff, until I'm far enough away from it that I that it no longer feels like something I made. Have you had those well, Have you had those moments where you've written a song and then? Like, Couple years later, listened to it and said, "Jesus, this was really good. Why? Why was I? Why was I so hard on myself about it?" No, it's always the opposite. I listen to it and I go, "Ha ha ha! Oh, I see what the flaw in this song is now." Yeah, yeah that's. I, I do that's that more rough. often than the, than the other. But I think that this goes this goes hand in hand with the like you know write a song and just finish the song and judge it later right. thing. Yeah. You know, like um, you know because. While you're writing, of course, you're, it, that doesn't mean just like blurt, blurt it out on the page and then judge it. Like you're still writing, you're editing, you're actually writing something, you know. And the divestment of of such you know turgid uh, you know ego in in everything that you write um, is has been an important part, I think, of me getting better as a songwriter. To divest yeah. that you know, from the process. It's a very fine line to to really enjoy what you're writing uh, without getting into an ego frenzy mm-hmm. about it and, and wanting to believe that it's great because it's coming out of you. Yeah, and, and that and, is a smaller yeah. line than you. And feeling yeah. terrible when you don't feel that. Well, that's the thing. problem. I mean, it's like if you if you're if you veer off into this, this is the greatest thing ever written. <laughs> then the danger is you're immediately going to flop over into this is the biggest piece of shit that uh, yeah, man has my, ever created. My problem, I think, is that I was in an ego frenzy a long time before I started writing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. So everything I've done subsequent to that, I just plug into my pre-existing ego frenzy. Right. And go, How does this make me feel? <laughs> right. 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 How does this make me feel about myself? Yeah. 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 Or, yeah. I like to be inside it, when, and so I kind of escape. Yeah. Most of the time, I escape that. How does this make me feel about myself? It doesn't really. I'm not using it for that. I'm, it's it's a lovely thing to. It's a privilege to be able to play music and, and write anything. Right? Right. It's, one of the things that I know. I mean, when I'm when I'm writing books and when I'm writing other things or just existing in the world, um, mm-hmm. I have this uh, the saying where I say um, the the failure mode of clever is asshole, and. Um, <laughs> And the, and I and I find that happens a lot when I'm writing something and I'm trying to either make a, a direct statement or to a, you know or to sort of one up somebody or to where it is the thing where you're like oh you you want to see what I can do here and you you kind of go into it heedlessly uh, without uh, consideration of uh, what it is. Not what it is that you're trying to say, but what the, the ramifications of what it is that you are, uh, how you are trying to say it. And that seems almost like right. what, kind of where you're going with that. I mean, in the sense of uh, you, to hit that balance of being able to be insightful, being able to be incisive, um, but at the same time not basically 
doing the writer equivalent or the songwriter equivalent of just enjoying the smell of your own farts. <laughs> you. Sorry. <laughs> Was there a question in there? No, no. Oh my god. I voiced it on your own but six, that's six You know what? I know what? I got no comment there. So, uh, actually, I'm going to go way back uh, to one of our original, uh, to one of the original things you said about uh, learning the music theory. You know, how you were starting off and just doing, here's a C chord, here's a, you know, diminished section. We talked about chord progression. Yeah. 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 And just writing and songs. And that, that whole thing about there is the discipline of you eventually have to put music to the, to the words or words to the music, and how do you marry those, and, and how does that well, work? I'm a big believer in structure. And, and uh, I, I went to a music school that I heard about, and uh, I, uh, I, I went to it because I heard that you did not have to audition. Because um, me playing my two Dylan songs and acoustic guitar pop probably would not have gotten me into a music school. <laughs> so they, in fact, I didn't get into it, but they had a, a, a summer session that if you just paid, if you could pay, you could go. So I, I went and did the summer session, and I was like, this is my fucking chance, and I'm not going to blow it, and I'm going to be one of those people who practices for four hours a day. I, um, I went as a, uh, I wanted to learn how to play bass, so I went as a bass major. And um, and I practiced four hours a day, and they they just had a, they had a very naturalistic way of teaching music theory that was very simple, and and you know just made me realize that um, some chords want to go to other chords, so when you put those chords first, they will want to go to the next chord. Maybe try that. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, and that's really that's really what I do. Um, uh, so I would try that first, and if I didn't like the way it sounded, I would try some other substitutions, but it gives me something to choose from, rather than going, well, I know a C, I know an A, I know an E minor, I know an F, so maybe I'll throw those together and see, and, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but, but choosing them randomly was not working for me. But, uh, but hearing chords together, I, I can always just come up, I just can sing a melody of some kind over, over that. Uh, I think my big weakness is, is rhythmically. I tend to do the same thing over and over. It's it's. Uh, I love a good waltz. I will happily write waltzes till the cows come home. But so that's that's really you know it's really. I mean, as far as writing lyrics like that, that's just like a do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. And you get better at it. But you also have to give a shit. You know, like you're never going to write a good lyric if you don't give a shit about you know a concise rhyme scheme or you know alliteration or wordplay, like, if you don't care about those things, you're not going to come up with it, probably. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at you. No, just because I wanted to, I, she said chord progression earlier, and I wanted to talk about it, because it's, it, it's so important, and um, a lot of the times, audiences don't know that it's important, yeah. but we're totally making you do fucking stuff with chord progressions, <laughs> and you guys don't even know it. And um, a lot of the stuff that I consider like heart, what I call heartstring chords, um, which are chord progressions, and I I tend to go, I'm I was raised Muslim, and I'm totally not Muslim, and uh, but uh, gospel chord progressions are like my favorite yeah. chord progressions of all, and they go a fucking way, yeah. and they make people feel a way, and they make me write a certain way, um, and. So learning really early on that those were the kinds of things that I loved. Um, and I also came from a, a musically trained uh, background and learning how to play stuff and doing that and be like, yeah, that's cool. I'm going to use like none of that, just just how to play these things. Um, but the idea of having that, um, I think, kind of drives everything else. Like the idea that I have uh, these melodies behind things. And the feeling from it and the words come after that, or maybe even before that. But um, I'm just thinking in terms of those progressions, maybe even lyrically, not just melody-wise, just progressing in that sort of way to go up and down and kind of have a roller coaster ride. Yeah. And as a, as a fan of music, you know, you 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 may not you may not know that you're hearing that yeah. when you hear that. Um, but it does, you know, intuitively, you know, you're hearing something and you feel, you feel something. And I think that, you know, as a, as a writer too, if you, if you are, 
you know, if you are in connection with the things that move you, you can intuitively, you know, find those those movements that you guys are talking about. Yeah, as well. Yeah. A lot of those fucking popular songs that are just fucking popular, people have no idea why those are popular. It's because they use those chords and they use those progressions and they use those certain words that strike you and you're like, oh. Firework, I'm a fly. All right, cool. And then we go back down and go back up. It's it's yeah, a that's, science. That's yeah. the like the Swedish that's a real poetry apps <laughs> that they that's write songs in these days. Yeah. 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 My favorite yeah. thing that Amy does a lot is the bar of two or the bar of three, um, where the chord progression is maybe you know a pretty simple chord progression that you've heard a million times, but then somewhere in the turnaround, a beat goes missing or a couple of beats go missing. And it's, it's what, it's really good. I'm not aware that this happens. <laughs> it is really good. It, and it's, it's what you're saying, Ted. You've got to take 20, 20 seconds out of a song, and so you cut out all the... You're, you're like, well, I, could get, I got to the end of this, and I could just go the extra two beats to the turnaround where it's obvious, or I could just take that, yeah, that five yeah. seconds out and just get right to the chorus. Yeah. And that, it, that turns the whole song on its ear. You are aware of what this is. I, I, I enjoy praise, so I accept your statement. Amy has a chord of silence, and it's really beautiful. But so it takes normal chords, and, but somehow that, that uh, just the kind of moving them around yeah. uh, turns, it, turns it into a whole new thing. Yeah. I do that a lot. Uh, right, I, right. I feel like Amy accuses me of doing that a lot, actually. <laughs> I, I, I think it's one of the great tricks of music, you know, yeah. just like, don't bore us, get to the chorus. <laughs> I'm going to ask one more question, and then we're going to go ahead and open up to questions. So be thinking of the, your question. And in fact, actually, to make it easy, if you do have a question, go ahead and line up over here, so and I can just uh, hand you the mic to ask a question. So while I'm asking this, go ahead and line up. Um, we have, One of the things that is obvious, uh, listening to all of you talk, um, is each of you have a process, but the process is different each of you. Um, and uh, one of the things that I do want to, to touch on, because this uh, does affect new writers, whether the songwriters are writing uh, you know, books or articles or whatever, um, is that moment when that process, that thing that you do, that you know ends up with uh, music or books or whatever, um, breaks down. Um, and you, you are kind of left in a, in a hole. What do you uh, has this happened to you? What do you do when that happens? Uh, I have deliberate games that I play that just make it make it fun. And I did, there was a point where I did have terrible writer's block, and so I started doing these games. I'll write chords on little pieces of paper and throw them up in the air. Whatever chords show face up, that's my chord progression. And I'm allowed to change it, you yeah. know, because if you're changing it, it's because you're starting to get into it. Uh, I will cut words out of newspaper headlines and move them around. Uh, I have this very overly elaborate game I do where I pick a word, put that word into iTunes, and then pick a sentence out of whatever iTunes podcast looks <laughs> up at that word and, and whatever the whatever song comes up based on that word. That's my that's my tempo and that's my uh, that's my you know vibe and, and then use the chord. You know, so I'll do these very deliberate things like, you know, it's a game. Write a song. You have ten minutes. Go. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I um, I'm also going to try these games that you are for some reason just now <laughs> revealing to me. We've written an entire LP and more together. This has been a very special uh, episode. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I hit, uh, I hit writer's block, um, sometimes. I, I, I almost always, uh, start with, uh, a melody, you know, and not a lyric. Um, and sometimes that, that can be as elaborate as actually, like, hearing the whole thing, you know, playing in, in my head, um, from the get-go. But, you know, lyric writing comes, comes a lot harder to me than, than, music writing, and, you know, partly it's, I, I continually trip myself up on, you know, feeling like I need to, again, like, say the most important thing that I've ever said, you know, in every line of every song. 
Um, and, you know, I, I have to really do, like, I have to really do, like, walk away, kind of take a walk, like, breathing exercises to purge myself of that, that, uh, that feeling that, like, literally stops my, you know, my tongue from, from being able to move and make words. Yeah, we're just generally really hard on ourselves. <laughs> like, a lot. Like, oh, this is going to be the last thing ever said in life, in a song. This is it. This is the fucking one. Um, uh, my challenge, I guess, uh, started really happening when I was like, ah, oh, I, I realize that I work backwards, so I kind of work from the future. Um, so... Even if I didn't make the music that is going to the song, I hear it and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna working backwards from the awards to the video. <laughs> so I kind of make the song after that, which is really weird. Um, That's cool, though. I like that. It, it's it's, it's that horrible. Song. I'm it's gonna fucking turn out horrible. to be the, 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 a better songwriter from stealing all of yours. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and even worse than that is that I now write in real time. So I write everything. Um, I would normally have given even like, you know, any of the relationship songs, anything like two years. But I write things while they're happening so that I can be on stage performing them and being like, okay, this is fucking happening right now. That's crazy. Don't do that shit. <laughs> uh, do not live that life. It works for me. I would not advise it for anyone else. Uh, it's been working for two years, possibly. When I get writer's block, I spend five years jacking off on Twitter, and then I start going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't so if that works for you guys. I don't think there's anything that can be added to that one. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and get to the questions. So go ahead. Well, first of all, Amy, can you call my bandmates and tell them to finish recording the six songs they've been writing for ten years? Oh my god! But I find I'm I'm an extrovert, an extroverted nerd. But with music, when I'm not writing, taking part in writing with my band, becomes a very introverted thing, and it becomes very difficult for me. And this is the start. <laughs> um, is it something that you can do as an extrovert in a more uh, lonely fashion? Well, I think I, you know. I mean, I just the from from writing with with Ted and our band. You know, I mean, obviously, two people writing together is not is not particularly introverted because there's another person with you. Uh, I, I think it can be. I think it can be a group effort. Um, you know, everybody. You just have to pound out your own, you know, your own method of of doing it. You know, it doesn't have to be a, a super lonely, isolated kind of event. Are you are you asking the opposite though? Are you asking like, can you? How do you learn to be an introvert? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I basically have to huh. write my own music without collaboration. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, you have to start. You have to start trying to, you know, fill in fill in the the holes of what other people provide. You Get know, a video. looper pedal. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if, if you're used to having somebody come come with a chord progression and and you know you put the melody or, on it, or or if they have the almost finished thing, you put the words to it. You know, I mean, you're you're gonna have to sit there with a guitar and and play some chords yourself. And and uh, you know, but I mean, it's like it's like anything else. When you do it enough, it, it enmeshes with your, you know, your your brain, and your brain starts to then work behind the scenes, and 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 it becomes a different, you know, a different kind of process. It doesn't become so so deliberate like it does some of the work for you. But I mean, you do have to do it hundreds of times. Can I say too that you know when I started playing under my own name, um, it was about 1997, and I've been in bands for a, a long time, and um, the band that I'd previously been in, uh, I it was starting to disintegrate, and, and I quit, and it was, I was all, at that point, you know, I, I had sort of already gotten over the, 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 the game of, like, 
trying to be in a band and making records and making, gathering fans, and et cetera. And I was like, Bleh. And, and I, I was ready to kind of throw it all aside, but I, I still wrote, so, I just couldn't stop writing songs, honestly. And it was from there that I was like, well, I got all these songs, you know. I guess I'll go play them on my own. That eventually, you know, became a whole other thing with another with another band. But um, introvert or extrovert, like you don't ever have to stop writing songs. You know, you write songs to write songs. What you do with them is that's that's a different question. You know, and that's that can change depending on how you feel from one day to the next. Okay. Yeah, but it's very hard to break your dependence on other people if you're writing with other people, playing with other people, or you know, there's producers I've worked with who have you know done everything, and then, you know, I sort of found myself like, okay, what do I do now if I'm not working with them? But, you know, but art is forgiving, you know, I mean, and, and it's, it's it's okay to have a simple song, you know, like, I mean, there are two chord songs, there are one chord songs. It's it's okay to start out simple, simply, and sort of see where that takes you. John Roderick has a 14-minute one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the Ark of <Arkansas>. Stone. <laughs> <laughs> Um, for those of us who are in professions we are very passionate about, like you guys, um, especially creative professions, a lot of times it's great because we can go to work and it's not really work. But then there are days, sometimes it's weeks, where there's other stuff going <laughs> on and it is a job. At the end of the day, it's how you it's, it's how you bring your bread home. So when you get to that time... How do you handle it? Do you walk away? Do you have a way to get re-inspired? What's your way to get back into where it is a passion and not just a job? Uh, I cry for about two hours. <laughs> <laughs> and then I eat a bowl of pasta. <laughs> um, shit, I don't know. You just you just kind of have to deal with it. It just It is what it is, and this is what you've chosen. And there's some days that are fucking wonderful and you wake up in the morning and you're like, fuck yeah, this is the thing, you do music, isn't it great? And then the next morning you're like, what the fuck were you thinking? This is fucking crazy. Um, I, I, I think you just, um, you gotta find some sort of balance in, in knowing that it is work and it is that. And it's, it's really hard to explain, to be like, hey, you gotta think of it as both things. I don't know what it's going to be every day for you. I don't necessarily know. Um, and I, I, I also know that if it's something you're super, super passionate about, then that plays into it even more. Like, it's not just, hey, I like doing music, or I like doing this creative thing, whatever it is, and it's also the thing that brings me this source of money. Um, I don't know. There's not really a good answer for that. Yeah, I mean, the, the graph of, like, you know, uh, in Enjoyment and the grind, yeah. you know, or fulfillment and the grind, or whatever. They're they're always crossing, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, as as time, in a linear you know way as time goes on. And you know, I, the simple answer for me has always been like, look, at the end of the day, no matter what is, no matter how hard the you know Boise to uh, Spokane you know drive. That's quite a drive. Has been, you know, <laughs> Um, like, you know, okay. Boise to Spokane is not that bad of a All right, uh, uh, Missoula to, uh, Bend, to Oregon. Boise to Bend. All right, all right, that's not too good. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you, you do, the thing is, you get on stage, and, you, like, for us, you get on stage, and you get to, you get to play music, you know, and, and I mean, look, I'm not going to lie to you and say that even, you know, that that's always magical, you know, of course, there are times when you're feuding with your bandmates, or, you know, you just had such a terrible day that you really don't want to get on stage and perform, and that's not easy. But I think it, it's 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 been rare for me that you know you, you can't shed enough of that to actually perform in a sort of you know jo joyful in the like theological sense, you know, kind of co connected way. Um, and I, I can't say from too much experience, but I, I, I imagine that if you're a creative person who works in, in a creative industry, like Gene said, like you, you just kind of have to deal with those those. Um, it's those just gonna fucking cycles, suck, sometimes. you know, because you. Yeah, it's because, gonna fucking suck a lot. Yeah, because you know how good it is in the good cycles, and then when it's and you gonna know be that great, it will cycle around again. I have two. I have two things. One super corny. One just kind of practical. 
I, I, and and this is part of like just trying to become a more mature person, practicing letting go of stuff. And on stage is a perfect time to practice letting go of stuff because there's always something. You forgot a lyric. Fuck. You know what? Let it go. It's done. Because you're going to ruin the rest of the song for yourself. Just let it go. There's some weirdo in a Rush t-shirt right in front of the stage screaming at you. I'm right right next to you. I don't know. I'm sitting right here. Stop wearing that t-shirt. I'm a big fan of Rush. It's not that weird. Let it go. Move on. You're in the present. That's in the past. Move on. Just let it go. Like, and, and you, you know, in a tour, obviously, you can practice that a million times. But on stage, especially, because you'll really, you know, freak yourself out if you start thinking about the lyric you forgot or the thing, you, you know, the note you didn't hit or the bad note you just played or whatever it is or that you can't really hear what's happening, whatever the problem is. And the other thing is, and this is super, super duper corny, but there was a period a few years ago where, you know, I mean, I'm prone to, you know, serious anxiety and depression like all of us on stage, I'm sure. And, and I would, I would, I started to have this thought, well, music is supposed to be healing, so let the, let the music heal you. Like, just the sound, just the sound of it, just the playing of it and the sound of it, and what the bass player is doing and, and the drummer, just like, let, let the music itself heal you. And that actually worked. Like, that actually worked. And I, that's the corniest thing I think I've ever said publicly. <laughs> Thank you. The, the only thing I would add is Merlin Mann is always reminding me that most of my dissatisfaction uh, comes from feeling unappreciated. And it's funny to think that as musicians or artists, uh, that, I mean, we get appreciation is so much a part of our job. But when you're creating things, like the your expectation of appreciation is kind of free-floating and it's hard for other people to know about all the time. It's not like a lot of jobs, which is just like, I did my job, I got my money. You're making things. And sometimes you make something and you're like, here it is, world, and the world is just like, (laughs) and you're like, fuck. And that's a big component of how you rate your job satisfaction and how you keep working. But when you identify that as feeling unappreciated, that that's your core problem, then you have a, then you have somewhere to go. You have a, you, have, you can take that first step of like, oh, my problem is that I feel unappreciated, and and, and that often can help you move. We, we're actually going to have to do this question last. Sorry, too wordy. Yeah, it's, well, not, no, it's, it's not just you. We're very relaxed. It's all of you. So no, actually, <laughs> this has been fantastic, but we do want to make sure that people can get to karaoke. So last question, no pressure at all. You're going to be wonderful. Go. Okay, so this is mostly just for the women because I don't think that men experience this that much, but um, <laughs> I'm a 14-year-old female songwriter, and I play all, like, my music. Um, but I have people asking me, like, oh, who played the guitar for you on that? I'm like, no, it's me. So if you <laughs> get people, like, feeling like <laughs> you didn't fully create the thing that you created just because you're a woman. Yeah. What a great question to yeah. end on. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Damn it. Go. This is another two hours. <laughs> I mean, honestly, just as a witness, I could talk for two hours about this. Right. Yeah. But what, you, what you've got is four minutes. So. I actually have wildly supportive musicians that I work with who will, will praise my playing in a way that it's hard for me to do myself. So, and, and that's very helpful. Yeah, but, uh, you know, I mean, starting out, I definitely got, you're pretty good for a girl. I mean, I would, I got that many, many, many times. Um, when I step outside of rap, everything is great. Um, the sad thing for me is that uh, even within rap, it's always, um, I am a female rapper, which I don't understand why you have to say that first, because you don't say female fucking surgeon and shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so that, and I, I never get to talk about the other jobs that I do, which is mixing and engineering and producing and writing and doing all those things. Um, so outside of rap, it's fucking wonderful. Um, inside of rap, not so fucking wonderful. <laughs> On a sad note. <laughs> the, the thing you can do is... You know, find the find the people that you click with and yeah. who are who are gonna who are gonna support you and who are gonna help you be yourself without without having to at least worry about as much of that. Because that, unfortunately, in the world we live in, it's gonna be around. You know? But 
yeah, and, and, and not to be a downer about that, just fucking do whatever the fuck you want to do. And um, find other people who are like, oh, okay, that's fucking great. Let's talk about other things and let you do other things. And keep talking right. about it. Because yeah. Just fucking do it. You know, just do whatever the fuck you want to do. Yeah, there are lots yeah, of scenes out. out there. Talk it out. All right, on that note, I want to thank our panelists for coming. I want to thank you guys for coming out. Remember, now, uh, Karaoke is going to be in Studio B on the other side on uh, 3 Aft. Uh, go have fun with that. And again, thank you so much for coming to the panel.